Uh, so thanks everyone for being here. It's my pleasure to introduce Ethan Gordon. Ethan is um, a PhD candidate in Sid Srinivasa's group at the University of Washington. Um, he his real, He's very passionate, as you can see in the title, about a robot assisted feeding for people with upper limb motor impairments. Um, and his research interests more broadly include physics-based robot manipulation and online learning. Um, he did his undergraduate work at Princeton University where um, in electrical engineering and engineering physics. And he also uh, was involved in research as an undergrad in the control of neuromorphic silicon photonics, which I will fully admit, I do not know what that means. Um, he also has previously worked at Oculus VR um, as well as Honda Research Institute, Institute. So Ethan, thank you for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to your talk. All right. Thank you very much, Brenna. Let's get started. So hello, everyone. I'm Ethan, um, and I'll be talking today about tracti tractably adaptable, that's a tongue twister, food manipulation for robot assisted feeding. And uh, on the off chance, you might have seen pictures of me online, and it's probably me being fed by a robot, since I was the model for quite a few years of this project. Um, uh, as Brenna was saying, I have broad research interests in various aspects of human robot interaction and assistive robotics, uh, plus manipulation in general. Uh, dexterous manipulation and hand tool manipulation, although today's talk will be focusing on my work over the past five years or so in food manipulation with a little bit in human robot handoffs and, and uh, other aspects of uh, assistive robotics. So why robot assisted feeding? Well, there are at least a million people in the US alone who have uh, various mobility impairments that prevent them from uh, carrying out what are called activities of daily living or ADLs. Feeding is one of those. Um, and for uh, people who need help fe feeding from like caregivers, for example, um, we, you know, we brought some of these people in, we did interviews with them and we got basically some of the quotes you're seeing on screen that sometimes they're not, uh, they're not eating or they're barely eating because they feel self-conscious working with the caregiver um, or they feel like they're a burden to the caregiver taking up uh, all of their time, all of their conversation space. And the big, one of the quotes that really stood out to us, if I have a robot to do it, uh, it would be me feeding me. And that would be a huge deal, fostering that sense of independence. And so that's kind of been the North Star, the motivation behind all of this. And when we go forward talking about, when I go forward talking about food manipulation, all of our metrics, our systems, our assumptions kind of come back to the uh, user studies that we do and the conversations we have uh, with the people who need to have a, be caregiver fed every day. So for example, informing our system design. Um, we are working on a system uh, called ADA, the Assistive Dexterous Arm, that can be mounted directly to a user's wheelchair. Um, the base is a Kinova Jayco 2, um, which some users already have on their wheelchair for pick and place tasks and things like that. Um, we add a force torque sensor for safety, um, both to make sure we're not going through the table, but also to make sure if, if there's any unexpected force on the fork, we're not gonna hurt the user or anybody else in the vicinity. Um, so this year is a video demonstration of our robot from a few years ago to kind of show the whole system coming together. Um, conversations with users have informed our uh, limitations and assumptions. So you could ask the question, for example, why use a robotic arm with a utensil when there are potentially a billion ways to pick up food, as you can see on the left there? Um, well, one reason is it's intuitive. It's using a single utensil is what caregivers do with people who need help with feeding. Um, and additionally, it is available for the commercial systems that exist on the market. So one example is the system OB, um, which does basically you choose one of four food items and it will do a, a sort of uh, hard coded motion to pick up the food item and go to a preset spot by the user's mouth. Uh, so this is a, uh, what is it? A system that people are used to um, and that therefore that's a system that we are trying to adopt, this robot arm with a single utensil. Uh, speaking with users also informs our metrics. So for example, we ran this user study uh, with um, nine users um, with various levels of mobility. Um, and we got metrics, for example, how long they took to feed themselves if they did use the arm. So uh, for example, a caregiver would take about 20 seconds to feed somebody a bite. Um, but if they teleoperated the arm themselves, one user reported spending up to 40 minutes because they can only use a sip and puff system to control their uh, six degree of freedom arm. Um, and uh, while different users had different preferences for how 
like how much they're okay with the robot having acquisition errors, like errors picking up food. On average, they preferred about 80% success rate. So that's kind of the metric we're going to use when we're talking about how well do we have to pick up food items, how well do we have to acquire food items. That's kind of our North Star metric from this study. So a lot of technical challenges in robot assisted feeding um, from the manipulation side to the human robot interaction side and everything in between. But again, this talk is going to focus mostly on the manipulation aspect. So the kind of the main question of this talk is, can we use structure and pro, uh, around the problem and around the assumptions we're making, as well as human expertise, because we are all experts uh, to a certain extent with picking up food, something most of us have to do every day. Uh, can we use that to reduce a hard learning problem to a more tractable and well-studied one? So this is kind of a summary of the talk today. Um, and we're gonna start with the problem formulation. Why is this a hard problem? So this is kind of the formulation that we're going to go with here, which is at the beginning of the meal or the beginning of a given bite, the robot goes above the plate and sees a bunch of different food items. This is our context, uh, our context space. What is the state of the food item on the plate? Um, and then we want the robot to execute some sort of trajectory or control policy, both um, to be able to get that food from the plate onto the fork. And we want uh, a success rate to at least be above that 80% that we gathered from our user study before. We want the probability of that success to be pretty high. So coming at this problem, what are kind of some of the simple solutions that uh, we can tackle first? What are our baselines? So one baseline is let's just collect no data. <laughs> let's just choose a single trajectory. This is what, what Obi does, for example. And there are a lot of examples in the literature of um, uh, robots mostly focusing on the HRI side, like the uh, the behavior of the robot throughout the entire feeding process that don't care as much about the food variety, that's not what they're studying. Um, they will often go with just a single motion, a single primitive, maybe potentially uh, conditioned on where the food is. Um, and that does work decently well um, for these kind of limited settings. Um, but when we start increasing the variety of the food, even if something is relatively simple as like a hard boiled egg, just a simple up and down motion like one size does not fit all um, as you can see this example of when we are skewering um, a single egg in the middle the yolk could fall out um, or another example if we just naively do up and down with a carrot um, we can't pick up the carrot if, it, if the tines are like oriented the same way as the carrot as it's more likely to roll away so these are some of the issues with fixed trajectories Another example, what if we just learn everything? We just either do a, like an imitation or a reinforcement learning approach. We just collect all the data. Uh, the context space is all the food. The action space is every single possible joint torque that can happen on the robot. Uh, and for examples of this, we have nothing. <laughs> the reason for that is there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, elements that make this a pretty difficult way to move forward. Um, one of the main ones is the data collection problem. So uh, food simulation is very hard. Uh, there are some simulators on the market that can do it, mostly ones that have looked into like, uh, was it uh, organ manipulation, like looking at the dynamics of how like organs move for like robot surgery and things like that. Um, these are, uh, so they, they, they exist, um, but they're definitely at minimum very computationally intensive. Um, we don't need just uh, deformation of like the geometry of the food, but because we're doing things like skewering, and scooping, we need to be able to deform the topology of the food. And so that makes simulated data very difficult to collect. And of course, real world data, also very difficult to collect. There's one study that's cited later in this talk where uh, just for evaluating 10 different trajectories on 16 different food types took about 85 hours um, of human time on the robot. So that makes it very hard to just collect all the data. So that kind of leads to the purpose of this talk. How can we get, uh, adaptable food manipulation so we can handle all foods the user might want, including those that we have not seen, the robot system has not seen before, but how can we get that adaptability uh, tractably so that we can operate this robot, you know, in a user's home setting without the need for sort of unreasonable simulation or data collection demands. So let's jump off to the first, let's see, okay, first heading here, which is the tractable action space. So how we can use human informed actions to make at least one side of this equation a little easier. So uh, when I was first coming into the University of Washington, the lab there, um, there was one study that was done previously that looked into just having humans pick up food and just recording where the fork went and how much force was applied. And from this work, um, the authors derived a sort of qualitative taxonomy. 
a lot of the users' actions could be classified as uh, there was a twirl for noodles. That was one of the food items here. There was scooping motions for more liquid food items, and then there were skewering motions. And in the skewering motions, there were a few elements that kept coming up again and again. Um, various amounts of tilt that the users used for different food items, um, more up and down for harder food items like carrots and more from the side for soft food items like bananas, um, as well as wiggling and potentially using only a few of the times to increase the pressure. So this was coming in, this was kind of like what was uh, known about how people pick up food, at least in the single utensil setting with a fork. Um, so informed from that we looked into okay let's just isolate one of these components that was one of the most uh prevalent in skewering the tilt um that could be used for different solid food items and let's just come up with a simple like three primitives instead of one the straight up and down primitive the tilted so that the tines are vertical which you see on the left is good for grapes as an example because it can pe higher pressure pierce through the skin um and then a sort of angled skewering motion for softer food items um, and let's just start with these handcrafted primitives and see how well they do. Uh, and when we answer the question, okay, how do we choose each of these tilt angles based on the food item, let's just end to end learn a classifier, right? This classifier was called Spawnet, and basically given an image of the food item, it will predict wh what the uh, expected success rate is of each of these uh, skewers, and then we just choose the one with the highest expected success rate. And this worked pretty well for solid food items. Like we get pretty close to our 80% benchmark. Um, and now this is on solid food items. Uh, there was, and that uh, gray line is on food items that were seen before, so trained in the classifier. There was some generalizability. So when we pulled a uh, food out of the training class, we still had better than random performance um, on choosing the correct tilt angle for that food item. Um, so in general, this worked pretty well. A few discrete actions can actually cover a decent chunk of the context space. Uh, it's kind of the key insight from this work. But there is some limitations here. We only focused on tilt. We're missing a bit of the human taxonomy. Um, and because everything, was, there's some generalizability, but because a, this classifier was trained in advance, it's unclear how we would adapt this online. Um, let's put a pin, though, in some of those limitations and jump on forward to that second point. How do we add adaptability? And for that, we can model byte acquisition as a contextual bandit, specifically because we are treating the entire trajectory that the, that the motion is, uh, sorry, we're treating the entire trajectory that the robot is taking as a single action. So contextual bandit, I have dropped the word. What does it mean? <laughs> so uh, let's work up to what a contextual bandit means, starting with uh, the multi-arm bandit. Um, so contrary to popular belief, it is not the robot at the upper left stealing your things with multiple arms. Uh, the name comes from the one-armed bandit, which is uh, a slot machine. And so you know the way a slot machine works. It has some payout distribution, probably with a negative expected reward, but we'll ignore that for now. You select one machine, you pull the lever, you observe one reward. Um, now the multi-armed bandit is, what if we have like a row of slot machines and each one has a different payout distribution? So you example these four machines up here. Um, and machine two has the highest payout distribution, but we don't know that coming into the casino. We just we just see the different slot machines. Um, so the multi-arm bandit problem is we want to pull the arms so we get information about what the payout distribution is. Um, that's kind of the exploration we want to do. But we also, once we know which machine is the best, that's the arm we want to pull the most. So it's that trade-off between uh, exploring a whole space of bandits uh, a whole space of slot machines and where we don't know the payout distributions and then exploiting once we have more information. Um, the contextual bandit, you can imagine this entire scenario, but in the background of the casino, there's a giant billboard with an image on it. And that image, based on what's on that image, the slot machines have different payouts. So uh, that kind of adds state to the problem. So the, the online learning loop is you observe this billboard, you observe the context, um, and then based on some sort of policy that you're probably learning, you choose uh, one of the bandits to pull, one of the arms to pull. Um, and then based on the payout you get, you update your policy, the billboard changes, and now you have a new context. Um, this is a contextual bandit setting. As an aside, if you're coming from sort of the RL literature, uh, a contextual bandit is reinforcement learning. Like theoretically, it's the same problem. The only difference is all of your episodes are length one. Um, there is no state transition function. Each state is assumed to be not necessarily dependent on previous states, and the action has only has an effect on the reward. 
Um, so because of that, you may see some algorithms come up that are in the RL literature um, as also being present in the contextual bandit literature. For example, uh, this exploration strategy, Epsilon Greedy. So this is a, a policy basically where we have some uh, expected reward for each of our arms, um, but with some probability, probability Epsilon, we just explore everything. So um, even the arms that we have a very poor estimate of. And the idea here is that epsilon percent of the time we're exploring, one minus epsilon percent of the time we are exploiting. It's a very simple algorithm. Um, again, you may have seen it in the reinforcement learning literature as well as a, as a baseline because it is empirically pretty competitive. Um, but uh, in this work, another algorithm that we're looking at, and the one that we use in this work, is uh, lin UCB, the linear upper confidence bound algorithm. So whereas a greedy algorithm would have sort of an expected reward for every single arm you can pull, and it will choose an arm based on uh, that expected reward only, what then UCB does is it says, I have all this data I've collected, I can create confidence bounds around that expected value. And instead of playing to the expected value, I will play the arm to the top of the confidence bound. And as I get more sure about the performance of the arm, that confidence bound will, sw will shrink, so the upper confidence will lower. So that kind of gives you an, an implicit trade-off between exploring and exploiting because you're more likely to choose arms you're unsure about with high bounds, but over time you're more likely to choose arms that perform better at uh, with higher expected value. Um, so the upshot of all this is that we can mo uh, model byte acquisition as a contextual bandit. We observe the food item, that's the context, that's the image is the context. Uh, we could use Spawnet. For example, I said Spawnet predicts the expected reward of every single possible uh, action we have trained it on. Uh, we select a single action, we execute the action, and then we observe a cost. Um, and more specifically, we can model this as a linear contextual bandit with a, a few small simplifications. First is what we can do is we can train Spawnet, and the last layer of Spawnet is actually just a linear layer, um, so just a matrix. We can freeze the entire network as a featureizer and only expose that linear layer as our linear policy that we can update over time. Um, and additionally, there's one more assumption. We assume that the reward is stochastic. There's no evil demon that is being giving us adversarial rewards. This is just the real world. And so under those assumptions, we can use uh, the LinUCB approach. So just kind of putting it all together, we uh, you get the uh, food context, image of the food item, um, we run it through Spawnet to featureize it. Um, we run it through our linear model, um, which is the last layer of Spawnet to get the expected loss and a confidence bound for each uh, action we could take. We select a single action. We execute that action, observe the binary loss, and then we use that to update our linear model. We just do a single learning step. And when we do this, um, we find that now over time, uh, this system has not seen a banana before, we can figure out, okay, what is the optimal action? Um, so here uh, for bananas, uh, of these three tilts, the because it's soft, the tilted angle is the optimal action. You know, so you know, ten to twenty trials, and our robot figures that out. Um, so we have this adaptability, but is it tractable? So empirically, how long until the observed success probability, not just the expected one, um, reaches that user threshold of eighty percent? Now, what's nice about the contextual using contextual bandits um, is that we can, uh, in a theoretical space, we can look at the theoretical contextual bandit literature, um, which uses a metric called regret. Um, now, rather than going into regret, I'll just basically say for our purposes, you can think of it like cumulative loss, which is uh, the number of failures, right? So how fast does the number of failures grow, right? If the slope of that line is is one, then we fail every time. If it's 0.8, then we fail 80% of the time. Now, as you would imagine, that line ideally isn't linear. Ideally, we're learning over time, and so that line will level out. And that's why the theoretical regret of like Lin UCB, for example, has the square root in it. Over time, we incur less and less cumulative loss as we learn more about the system. But what's important is that you can see that this inside the square root, we have T, so over time, we have the square root behavior, but it's also dependent on the dimensionality of the context as well as the number of actions. So the size of our context space and the size of our action space. And so one way to get a more tractable problem is to shrink the size of our context space. Um, 
So what happens when we make the contact space smaller? That's kind of what's represented here. Um, we get the same coverage, right? We by changing how we represent the food item, we don't change how well an action performs on it. So we get the exact same foods that can be covered by a given action, but we can get a lower regret because it's easier to learn which action is the best for a given food item. Um, now, one way we can actually do this is with haptics. Um, so in some previous work coming into the lab, um, actually part of the same study that looked at humans picking up food items, um, they one of the key takeaways of that study was that uh, actually the force used in acquisition, just the Z-force even, um, was really predictive, um, was really powerful in predicting uh, and classifying food items by their haptic properties. In this case, a four-way classification, hard, hard skin, medium, and soft. So you can get like 75% accuracy with just the first 50 milliseconds of Z-force after coming into contact with the food. So that's nice. We could potentially, like haptics would be a really good way of distinguishing between food items, even potentially better than vision. I mean, the grape and cherry tomato are look totally different to a computer because they're different colors, but they're practically the same haptically. And so we would expect the same action to work for both. Uh, so haptics would be great if we could utilize that. Um, the problem is that while we get visual context before we make the decision, uh, we get this haptic information when we skewer the food item after we make the decision. Uh, so how do we use it? Well, we can actually make one assumption. Um, we can assume that our loss is a linear function of both some visual context and some haptic context simultaneously. And so even though we only get the, we can't use the haptic information uh, of a given trial to make a decision on that trial, we can still use it during the learning step after we get the loss. Um, and that can help us optimize both the visual and the haptic context models simultaneously. And so when we go back to our full system, after we execute the action, we observe this force torque data, this post hoc haptic context. Um, we run it through a featureizer, so same featureizer they used for food classification a few years ago. Uh, and then we have a second linear model, two matrices that we can optimize together, regularized against each other um, so that they're producing the similar results. Um, so in that way, by regularizing them against each other, we actually kind of impart some of this haptic information into the visual model. Uh, and that in theory could allow the visual model to learn more quickly. Um, and that's actually what we see empirically. So in this example, um, in this particular experiment, uh, we tried on a whole bunch of food items, that's why the attempts go up to 60, but I'm just showing these uh, two similar food items, kiwi and banana, uh, as an example. And you see at the beginning, we incur kind of linear regret because the system has no idea what any of these food items are, and it's just trying everything. But over time, you can see more quickly, um, it learns a little more quickly with this haptic context uh, augmented model. Um, and you see over time, the cumulative losses, this blue line ends up lower than the orange line. Um, and so that's kind of a, an empirical demonstration of the fact that even though we get this context afterwards, we can still use it for faster learning. So that is one way of making the context space tractable. Let me back up a little bit to the action space, because all this time we've just looked in actions that change that one component, that tilt. So how do we kind of use the entire taxonomy? Uh, of human fork acquisition, um, but still keep our action space small enough that we can use the contextual bandit. So the key assumption in this part is looking at uh, continuity. If we can design an action space such that under some distance metric, uh, similar actions have similar performance for a given context, um, then what is it? Then, well, we can look into potentially leveraging that continuity to increase our coverage. So what would a continuous action space look like? So this is a schema that we came up with, uh, food acquisition action schema. Um, it is basically a 26 continuous parameters that define a, a linear approach, a uh, Cartesian uh, sort of what we call grasp motion, a twist, and then an extraction twist defined in different reference frames so that each uh, parameter, each phase is kind of independently defined of previous phases. Um, and the whole goal of this was to design a sort of parameterized space of actions um, that uh, had some sort of notion of similarity under the Euclidean metric, right? Euclidean metric assumes that different components are orthogonal, they have no bearing on each other. Um, 
And also this action space is uh, broad enough to be able to implement the entire taxonomy of actions from before. Um, you can just skewer, approach, extract, that works. The grasp can be a twist motion. Um, so we get the twirls. Um, we can also come in at an angle. The grasp can be kind of a, a, a scooping motion and then we can get that as well. As a bonus, it's also a relatively interpretable space. So we can make manual tweaks to it later. So now we have this continuous action space, what can we do with it? Well, what we can do is in this action space, we can, um, sorry, what we can do is in this action space, we can collect a bunch of human data uh, and map it into this action space. We have some sort of expert distribution. Uh, and because of the continuity, because it's a, apologies, because it is uh, an expert distribution, we know each one of these is likely to have some non-trivial coverage inside of our context space. And because of the continuity assumption, we know that it's likely that if we have a similar action under our distance metric, it's likely to cover a similar part of the space. So if we want to cover more of the space, we should look further away. It's not a guarantee, of course, but uh, we shouldn't be looking right next door if we want to have a chance of coverage. And so we can use uh, clustering just off the shelf as a way of getting the spatially diverse sampling within our expert distribution. Uh, and the result is a discrete action space from our schema. So we collect a bunch of human data, map that into our continuous schema to get a set of uh, continuous parameters. We discretize that using clustering into a discrete uh, space of acquisition actions. And that discrete space is then used in our contextual bandit. So let's look at some of these uh, actions. When we actually look at some of these actions, we can see that uh, after the clustering, we actually recover quite a bit of emergent behavior that we saw were successful when humans are picking up food. For example, in the upper left, you can see the fork kind of wiggling to get a better grip on the on the lettuce. Um, you can see for the sandwich coming in at that tilted angle, we recover that that the the tilt variation um, that was so helpful in puncturing through every single layer of the sandwich. You see we recover a scooping motion, for example, with mashed potatoes in the lower right. And one thing that wasn't even in the previous taxonomy um, what, that we identified here was tilted extractions. So as the food comes up, flattening the fork so that the food actually stays on the fork. So we see this behavior emerge and we do this clustering approach. And as a result, the, these actions perform better than just our tilting actions alone. So this is an example of what it use it looking at the best action for a whole bunch of food items to see how well they perform. Um, and for basically all of them, we can exceed the user benchmark. Spinach is actually really tricky. The experimental procedure was a little single leaf of spinach on the plate, which is tricky to pick up in the best of times. We were still able to find an action that was able to get it most of the time, although it was a little shaky. Um, but the idea is that we have sufficient coverage on a lot of food items. And these food items, I should note, uh, actually came from an interview with, uh, with users as like, here's an example of foods that we would want to eat. Uh, in addition to the foods that we used in previous studies. So we have pretty decent coverage, but what's even better is that it's only 11 actions. So we can actually plug it into our contextual bandit framework and get pretty decent online learning performance. You know, after about seven to eight rounds, we can hit the user benchmark. Um, and then by like round 12 or 13, like the 12 or 13th time we've seen the food item, like we know exactly what action to do for that food item. And we can basically approach the best possible um, performance that we can have with this given action space. So this is actually good enough that we are using this uh, acquisition framework and moving, our next step is kind of moving towards an in-home deployment with this framework, um, being able to install our system in someone's home for about a week. Um, so that's basically how we get tractable, tractably adaptable food acquisition. Uh, I want to end a little bit with like, how can we take some of the principles from this acquisition and extend it to other problems? For example, the byte transfer problem. Um, let's look at the byte transfer problem because we can model it similarly to the acquisition problem. Um, but now the context kind of has two components. There's the, the state of the food on the fork, and there's also how the user would prefer to be fed, as well as if they have any like assistive components around their face that need to be avoided. And the action space, similarly to acquisition, is a whole collection of trajectories and control policies, probably less on the control side because the idea is that we're not trying to hit anything, although if we're going into the user's mouth, now we reintroduce the need for uh, real-time control. But let's look at trajectories for now. So one way of doing this, since we're just coming up with trajectories, is to use a sort of off-the-self trajectory planner. We can sample a whole bunch of possible goal positions 
around the user's face for the food, uh, and then we can plan to those goal positions using some sort of heuristic um, that can help us map the, the user's preferences onto the trajectory. So here's some example of heuristics we looked at before. So one heuristic is uh, what we call efficiency, which is basically how well does the food, uh, is the food placed around the mouth as opposed to like up by the nose. So like if it's a long carrot, we want the carrot to kind of be pointing into the mouth as opposed to being perpendicular to the mouth and blocking the entire face. Um, so uh, another possible heuristic we looked at was uh, a comfort heuristic. We don't want the robot to be up in front of the user's eyes, as an example, as it's doing its motion. And what we find is that users prefer trajectories that are optimized according to these two heuristics. So you see the baseline above goes right in front of the user's eyes. I mean, it's still not perfect either way, but uh, when we ask users, which one do you prefer, uh, they prefer trajectories that don't go in front of their eyes and trajectories where the, the carrot is around their mouth as opposed to perpendicular to their mouth. Um, so applying some of the uh, ideas from acquisition, um, different users may have different preferences. We only looked at two heuristics. We could imagine you know, a dozen heuristics based on what different users prefer. Um, and, di and different users could value different heuristics differently. So you can imagine creating your action space effectively as a space of heuristics, trajectories optimized according to different weights of all of the heuristics. And a hypothesis could be that this space could be continuous with respect to human preferences. And so that would allow you over time, again, um, to potentially tractably learn for a given person based on their feedback of uh, the byte transfer process, how you should optimize your trajectory. And this is an example of potentially what could be done for future work. Um, so kind of in summary here, uh, you can use the structure and uh, expertise um, in a problem to reduce sort of the hard learning problem to a more tractable and well-studied one. Um, huge thank you to all of the different co-authors and colleagues who are helping with this work. Um, on the top where you have Amal, who's do, actually going to be doing some of the bite transfer work going forward, um, Bernie, Xiang, Sumek, Sunil, um, Ramya, and then at the bottom, all of the uh, co-designers and professors um, uh, that helped along the way. Uh, thank you very much. I realize I think I must have spoken too quickly because I'm ending about 10 minutes early. I apologize. So I am happy to go back and go over things if I went through them a little too quickly. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, we can open up the floor to questions that people might have. Um, I can get started with one. So Ethan, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about your choice of the contextual bandit for, um, for your learning algorithm. So it seems like it was well suited to the problem, but I'd be curious to hear what other algorithms you considered and why this was the one you settled on. Um, so it was actually one of the first ones we settled on. And the reason for that, um, possibly, apologies, I should go back here. Uh, and it was actually one of the first algorithms we settled on. Um, and the reason for that, um, is that, uh, kind of the philosophy of, uh, of the lab and the project going into it was let's start with the simplest approach and then get more complicated as we need the additional complexity. Um, so obviously presented in this talk, we're like, RL has this data issue, so let's start with the contextual bandit. But what actually was happening like uh, on the ground was uh, we first had Spawnet, and it was working pretty well just by predicting um, this discrete set of like three to six actions. And the question we were trying to answer was, what's the simplest way to add adaptability to Spawnet? Um, and that's what led us to the contextual bandit, because all the contextual bandit required was just updating this linear layer on Spawnet. Um, the afterwards, then we were asking the question, okay, how do we uh, improve upon Spawnet? Can we add more data? Um, and that's where we were sort of running into these data issues with a sort of general RL framework. Although we did consider sort of limited RL frameworks, two-step or three-step. There was one student who was working on uh, sort of pre-acquisition. What if we like, for example, push the food against the wall of the plate before picking it up? 
And so now we have this kind of pre-acquisition space and then this acquisition space that have dependence on each other and a state transition. Now we have RL again, but now with uh, two steps, basically. Um, so there was definitely work looking into kind of two-step, three-step RL approaches um, in that limited setting um, or that, sorry, limiting the amount of data that we would need to collect. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, I know for by transfer, uh, there was some work into sort of real-time optimal control, more of a of MPC style work as opposed to this learning style work, um, but that is still in the works. <laughs> Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I see Drew has a yeah. question. Also, if you have questions, you can raise your hand or uh, put them in the chat if it's possible. Yeah. Drew? Oh. Sorry, I think I just dot fingered the mute button. Um, not all forks are created equal. Some have longer times, some have wider gaps between their times, some are plastic, some are metal. I'm curious how you, if you've considered this and, and if you have, you know, how um, resilient do you think your work is to, if I say, take off the fork you have on your robot and put a plastic one on instead? That is a very good question. Uh, utensil switching in general. Um, I will say that all of our work so kind of the, one of the limiting factors of our work, let me just drop back to the system slide here. Um, we really wanted a very high fidelity force torque sensor um, on the fork. You can see in this left here. Um, and the main purpose of that was for safety. We have this uh, this very low latency sensor allows us to very quickly, if we you know touch anything we're not supposed to touch, we stop. And because of that, we actually 3D printed our own fork with an interface for that force torque sensor. So all of our experiments were done with a single type of fork. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, yes, that means that the sort of uh, expected success rate of our actions is going to be pretty dependent on this fork, um, as well as uh, all of the, the expert distribution of people picking up food will be very dependent on this fork. So. Uh, Going into it, I am not sure how robust we would be to like swapping out different utensils. Right now, for this in-home deployment, we are like requiring the user to have the specific utensil. Um, and but definitely something to look in forward to in the future is looking into utensil swapping. At very minimum, it's a fork. We need to pick up soup, maybe. So we might want to be able to add like a spoon or swap out between these utensils. And so um, there's a question of how well, as you said, do our actions work for those different utensils? Um, and that is something we could collect some data on or have our online learning algorithm figure out. I will say that there is a concept in the contextual bandits literature called slate bandits, um, where, where rather than choosing a single action, you can actually choose, like imagine you have different buckets, you could choose a different action for each bucket. So the first bucket might be choosing a different utensil and the second bucket then is choosing the trajectory, for example. Um, and that is a way to reason about what is effectively a single action, but there are two inputs to it that define it, which is the utensil and the trajectory. Um, I mean, you could also model it as two-part RL, but uh, it's kind of uh, potentially not intuitive to model like a state action state system where the second state is the same as the first state, just with a different utensil. Um, but uh, so that's a way that we could potentially expand this work into multiple utensils, because yes, you are totally correct. Uh, coming at it right now, we just have a single type of utensil. <laughs> Hope that answers the question. Hey, I think there's a question from Barish. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask, after you choose the proper action, how do you make sure that uh, that action is uh, performed correctly? And if you can elaborate more on like, how do you control the forces you apply uh, to the food? And if you are like in a closed loop manner, also correcting for uh, any disturbances while, for example, you are trying to do a high pressure, a vertical skewer, like how do you make sure that action is uh, performed correctly? Also a great question. So uh, the actions uh, are performed 
in a so at a high level we select the trajectory and then we do have a low level controller that uh, that operates in a closed loop format with respect to the joint states of the robot so as the robot's moving right we can read the joint states and we can figure out okay this is this is we're on track to the next waypoint in the trajectory um, we do also have some i wouldn't call it fully closed loop uh like fully closed loop reactive control but part of the action space, part of those 26 parameters um, includes, um, part of these 26 parameters includes actually the force and torque thresholds that define the transition from one phase to the other. So for example, when we do an approach, right, we say approach at this angle until you have a force of X Newtons. And then once you reach X Newtons, let's transition to the grasp and execute the grasp twist um, until or unless you experience a force of Y Newtons, and then you could transfer to the extraction phase. So it's kind of like not fully reactive control relative to the force of the fork experiences, but we do have, for example, we know like if we if something's wrong, if there's like a hard like lump in the middle of the food item, like we won't break the robot trying to go through it because we'll experience that force and transition to the next phase. Now, when it comes to like, is this accounted for in the learning algorithm, it, it kind of is implicitly. So in a certain sense, we're assuming that our loss is uh, a noisy function of the action selection, right? And so to a certain extent, we can model some of these disturbances uh, as uh, as sort of stochastic noises, stochastic disturbances, right? Um, and so uh, one example is our perception system. So we've been con constantly updating our perception system and constantly calibrating, calibrating, recalibrating the camera <laughs> because it's never perfect. Um, but what that will do is if there's an action that performs really well, if the camera is perfectly calibrated and there's another action that performs like 90%, but the camera does not have to be perfectly calibrated, right? Then our online learning system will eventually pick up on, you know, this, this one action kind of isn't doing so well and another action is doing very well under this current like camera calibration environment, basically. Um, and it will pick up on that. Um, there are ways to update the contextual bandit, contextual bandit learning framework to handle what are called non-stationary distributions. So for example, if the lighting changes and our perception goes haywire, the, the environment is now changed. And so while we don't do this right now with Lin UCB, you could basically have Lin UCB have kind of a receding time, uh, uh, short-term memory to a certain extent, where uh, over time it will learn that this distribution has changed. Um, so that is another uh, add-on that we could add um, if we run into issues with uh, environments changing or various disturbances. So I hope that answers the question. Right. Right. I think Kevin has a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, really interesting talk. A lot, a lot of content there that uh, we could potentially dig into for hours. Um, but not, you've got this slide up, so I'm going to ask about this a little bit more. I think you said there's 26 continuous parameters, and so I was just looking at how the actions are parameterized and trying to count up. Um, so let's just talk about the approach. So you've got mm -hmm. fork orientation and an approach vector and a frame. So is the food frame part of your 26 yeah. continuous parameters? So the frames are not part of the parameters. So the frames are defined based on the conditions of the environment. So the food frame is defined to be where the food item is, uh, what is it, where the food item is laterally in XY space and then at the plate, uh, on the plane of the plate in Z space. Um, and that is does not, uh, Part of the action space that's part of the effectively the condition on, on which the action is defined and the reason that there's these different frames the food frame for approach the approach frame which is the same as a food frame but rotated so that plus x matches the approach of the uh, of the fork and then the extraction being defined in the fork's own utensil frame the reason for those different frames is actually for uh independence of the different stages. So we want a Euclidean metric, right? But the problem is, let's say we change our approach angle, rather than coming in along food frame plus y, we come in along food frame plus x. Well, if we defined everything else in the food frame, then for example, a scooping motion could turn into an approach and then like a sideways scoop, for example, because we defined it in the food frame. So the point of these different frames is that we basically have a similar, a similar grasp and extraction motion, even when the approach motion changes. 
Um, so yes, uh, if to specify these frames are not part of the action, um, just listing off the, you know, the SO3 of the approach, the approach vector, the force and the torque thresholds for approach, um, the grasp twist and duration, which is seven degrees of freedom, as well as the force and torque thresholds. Same thing for extraction. So that's nine for extraction, plus nine for grasp is 18, plus eight for the approach, because we don't care how far we start from the food item. We just care about the approach vector. Okay, so uh, let's look at grasp then. So you hit say R6 times R. Yeah. Is that seven parameters? Yeah. I'm just trying to count. Seven parameters. And um, then you said there's force and torque thresholds that yes. say when this phase has ended? Yes, and that's now nine for that phase. So there's one, one force and one torque. Yes. We only okay. look right now at the magnitude. Uh, we don't look at the dimensions of the force and the torque vector. We haven't needed to. Okay. And so I, I'm going to call this a grape. I don't know if it's a cherry tomato. It's a grape. Or, yeah. It's a grape. Okay. Um, so the food frame then is defined just by the sensing. The sensing sees the grape and says, all right, here's where the food frame is. And so your control then is relative to that. Okay. Yep. Um, and then <clears throat> two other questions related to that. So, um, you say that uh, the these turn into 11 different actions based on expert demonstrations, is that right? Yep, so the idea is we have this 26 dimensional continuous space uh, on the right, and then we have a bunch of expert points that are somewhere in this space. Like mm -hmm. we, we do a procedure to take the human trajectory and we find sort of the best fit uh, schema trajectory. And right. then so somebody's coming in with a fork and you said, well, okay, we have a twist and a duration, but, uh, you know, the twist was changing constantly or something. You yeah. sort of fit a twist to it and say, yeah. That's, okay. So basically what we do, uh, at, at the, I can look up the specifics later. Uh, it's in our coral paper. Um, uh, but the specifics are, I believe that we take the motion, what we, the approach is until the user touches the food item. Uh, and then we determine the point of contact and then we linearize the velocity around the point of contact to figure out the approach vector. And then once we're in the food item, I think uh, we look for the maximum force the user applied. And up until that point, that trajectory, we linearize that. And then the trajectory after that, um, lifting up to, I think, a certain height above the food, we linearize that. So we just do a linear best fit of the kind of within okay, the food so the, and extraction. The processing is to take this basically infinite dimensional data and turn it into these 26 dimensional data. And then you turn it into a point in this space yep. and then do some kind of clustering. And that's how you yep. end up with your 11 actions. Exactly. Okay. Uh, sorry, last question for now. Sure. Um, if you go back to the previous slide. Uh, can you tell me what you mean by Euclidean metric each phase independent? Yeah, so the idea was um, kind of the reason that we would expect clustering to hopefully work and have good coverage is this kind of continuity assumption. Like we have need this assumption that under some distance metric, uh, similar actions will perform similarly. Um, and so the, uh, the clustering that we do, right, k-means also requires a distance metric, right? You need a notion of how close two actions are. And so the metric that we use is the Euclidean metric, just our standard Euclidean distance between two points. So in this 26 dimensional space, mm -hmm. you say the distance between two actions is just the Euclidean distance for yes. those 26 parameters that you define. Yes. Uh, and now that's a huge assumption. I mean, fortunately, empirically, these worked. Uh, but part of the motivation behind why we're making that assumption is that we try to define these different frames so that those parameters are kind of as independent from each other as possible. As I said before, like you don't want to change the approach vector and then suddenly rather than a scooping motion, you're like side scooping. Um, like your grasp changes because you change an approach parameter. Um, and so by defining these separate reference frames, that uh, helps us um, with, um, what is it, that helps us justify um, the use of the Euclidean metric. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see Drew has a question, so yep. I'll, I'll yield the floor. <laughs> so um, this is all very cool. My mind's racing to all possible places it could go. But I wanted to ask a question about the, um, you had a slide that showed the four different categories of sort of firmness. It's like hard on the outside, soft in the middle, and then hard, medium, and soft kind of a 
Yeah, that was capturing the uh, haptic information. Let me take a Correct. look here. Uh, here it is. Yep. So uh, the question is, um, have you at all considered or do you think that your learning algorithms could uh, take into account something that might change its haptic properties over time? So like ice cream melts, cheese, when it's warm, is soft, but as it cools, it gets harder. Um, would you know how would that complicate things and could you take that into account? That's a fair point. Um, because uh, basically the benefit of using the haptics is what if we have two food items that look similar? Um, uh, or I should say, what if we have two food items that look different but have similar haptic properties, or look similar but have different haptic properties, right? So, uh, to a certain extent, haptics, because it's collected post hoc, it can only do so much. So, for example, if the, the half melted ice cream looks identical to the um, to the hard ice cream, right? There isn't a whole lot we can do in advance because we don't get haptic information in advance. But um, what the haptic information could do, right, is first of all, it can create a distribution, an effective distribution that the context model matches. So if half of the time the ice the ice cream looking thing is soft and half of the time the ice cream looking thing is hard, right, then the visual model will look at it and be like, okay, there's a 50% chance this action works, a 50% chance that action works, I guess I have to flip a coin. Um, so uh, alternatively, right, that the haptics could potentially pick up on visual things that a just purely visual model might have trouble picking up on. So for example, the soft ice cream might have like little flecks of liquid on the side or a little bit more pooling at the bottom, for example. And our visual model alone might take a while to pick up on, hey, that translates to a different distribution, right, uh, uh, across our action space. But the haptic model, right, um, would see, okay, uh, for this scoop, it was soft. Um, therefore, this action is likely the best. And for this one, it was hard. Therefore, this action is likely the best. And then when the visual model is regularized against it, it could pick up on that pattern. Hey, when there's pooling, the haptic model says X. And when there's no pooling, the haptic model says Y. And so that is one mechanism by which the visual model could learn faster from the haptic model. But you are right that if two things look exactly the same or very, very similar and are completely different haptically, then yes, the best we could do because this is post hoc is like have a distribution and just flip a coin basically between the actions that work best. Um, Yes, these that we use this model as a as like our uh, haptic net baseline right there, like we use it to featureize our haptic information, but we don't like explicitly ask for the classification and feed that into the linear model. It's just uh, the fact that it worked for classification. We used it as uh, sort of a justification that hey, there's some information here that we could use to find more general patterns rather than just the softness of the food item. So again, I hope that answered the question. Cool. Uh, I could ask another question. <laughs> All right, we got five minutes remember. at least. Um, so uh, your once you've chosen an action, it is uh, basically a motion control trajectory, and maybe you're using the Canova's control system to do to follow the trajectory that you specified. Is that uh, right? We're actually using Ross control, so we're using the a modified version of the joint trajectory controller. Um, uh, we're just using. I mean, Canova has its own internal PID control, uh, but we command individual joint velocities at that level. Right, and then it's doing its own joint-based control. Yeah. That's all. Not something you can easily change in there. Right. Um, so, yeah, what uh, I'm curious in your opinion how important it is to use force or haptic feedback during the motion versus, you know, doing an, uh, a trajectory where the only feedback is, you know, uh, used by the PID controllers essentially um, mm -hmm. to to track your commands. Um, does it matter or do you have an opinion? Uh, you know, so I can imagine that uh, there is some level of impedance control going on when I'm doing the piercing of a grape and uh, grapes can sometimes, uh, you know, bedevil you with their firmness by sliding away from you easily, you know, yep. you know get high pressure in one of the tines. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, 
if you think that your system performance could be improved by having some sort of force feedback during the, the piercing part of the operation, or if you think it doesn't really matter, you know, you've done a lot of work with it and the success rate isn't uh, dependent too dependent on that capability. Well, I mean, it's a great question because like, it could they, like the answer could be both in the sense that we might be able to get a performance improvement. In fact, one of the first things we were brainstorming at the very beginning of this was, you know, what if we basically do like an inverse uh, inverse uh, pendulum uh, problem for the problem of staying on top of the of the grape and the grape rolls go back over it, right? And modeling it like that. Um, and, and the reason that didn't go too far forward was okay, that works well for grape, but uh, like doesn't matter for like cantaloupe or strawberry or like yeah, how much of an effect does it have for what would be a difficult problem to solve in the classical control in the classical control framework right um and so it's more of a uh, i can totally see us in a situation where it actually does make an improvement uh, at very minimum you're totally right like when we start touching the food item during the approach right we could totally like change up what our grasp is based on that force at minimum, right? That's the, uh, but you're, we can also do a much more, a much a shorter control loop, right? Where we change the individual joint velocities, right? Um, so I agree that we could, you could get in, improved performance that way. At the same time, we hit our user benchmark in terms of preferred, uh, what is it? Preferred acquisition uh, performance. So, uh, like basically my my statement here is like the system is good enough for the in-home deployment right now but that doesn't mean it can't be made better with the feedback control um because again you're totally right we the trajectories we we measure from people those people are almost certainly doing exactly what you said are doing basically some sort of closed loop control based on the force that they feel right um and so we could implement that um as some sort of maybe an impedance controller on top of the trajectory controller for example um, but that is uh, not something we do currently just because our system right now is good enough, but it is a thing we could add. Um, so yeah, that's a great question because it's a great point. <laughs> just more and more future work ideas. <laughs> just scrolling through to make sure there's no... Question, oh, sorry. Oh, I'll maybe follow up with um, just one final question, Ethan, and then the last minute we have. So um, you hinted at the fact that you're planning on doing a deployment in a home for a week. And yeah. so I can imagine, I can imagine, I can imagine all of all of the work that goes into that and all the considerations. And so I'd just be curious to hear um, sort of the the number one factor that you are keeping in mind that is like it that it, well I, yeah this is the, the number one factor that basically like if this doesn't work up to this level then we have to call it or if we see this happen in the home we have to call it uh are there are there aspects to to this deployment um like that that you guys are that are you guys are considering that is a, a very good question um and i think if I were to pick like one thing that like this has to work like perfectly or we cannot do an in-home deployment, it is our safety module. So um, the way that we uh, organizing our system right now is that there's one node running over here that's doing a whole bunch of checks. Most importantly, it's checking to make sure that the force torque sensor is working, like we're getting force values and they're not like uh, zero variance, like whether it actually is real values. Um, and so uh, in addition, it's also constantly checking a button that we would put next to the user's head, they can like hit if anything goes wrong. Um, and so if any of those fail, like this, this node is just constantly sending out what are called watchdog messages, right? Feeding the watchdog. And so if any of these safety checks fail, it will stop sending those messages and every single other node on the network needs to shut down. Where like the, the robot stops moving. Uh, and can only be restarted by like extra like uh, intervention. Um, and so we've been checking that uh, over and over and over and over again. Um, and so uh, and also there is going to be like the idea would also that there would be supervision as well in this particular example, you know, whenever the robot's in use, one of the researchers is going to be there in addition to potentially a caregiver if the user wants it. So um, 
so yes, that's kind of like our, if, if this system, if we cannot verify that this watchdog system works, we're just not, not doing it. It's not worth it because that safety system has to exist. <laughs> um, so that's kind of our main point, I think. I uh, hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ethan. This was great. Um, I see we're at the hour now. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak to the CRB and everybody for coming on this uh, last minute special seminar that we had today. So thanks. Uh, thanks again, Ethan. This was great. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, pleasure to see all of you. Pleasure to be all of you. Thank you, Ethan. Have a good rest of your day. Good luck with your thesis writing. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.